Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. And thanks to those who have joined online. And thanks, Steve, for inviting me to deliver this lecture. Uh, my name is Jack Greenberg, and I'm currently studying at Korea University. And uh, tonight, I'll be talking about mental health in Korea and why the system has relied so heavily on institutionalization and some of the reasons why the system has failed to respect and guarantee the human rights of individuals with mental disabilities. We got to full screen the presentation. Okay, there, it's working. Don't know how. I think we're going to get out of this and then we just, uh, let's see, this one. We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> No, that's that. Here, here, oh, there. I think. Is this the first slide? Of it? it should be on that slide. So, okay. Okay, yeah. So, before delving in, I want to highlight this quote from Theodore Jonyu. He's a professor at Yonsei University in the Department of Modern um, Korean Literature and Languages. And he says, Mental illness remains one of the most elusive and neglected topics in Korean history, and I certainly agree with him. There's a, a dearth of literature about this subject in English and Yu's book, uh, It's Madness, The History of Mental Health in Colonial Korea, is the only one I believe that covers it in any depth. But unfortunately, it restricts itself only to the colonial period. So tonight, I'm going to be trying to cover a longer term time horizon to show just how much continuity there is from the colonial period into the 20th century and to the present day when it comes to things such as criminalization and stigmatization of mental illness, restrictions on patients' freedoms, and a lack of capacity to provide proper treatment. I'm sure many of you are aware of the story of Crown Prince Sada. It's one of the earliest examples of mental health being treated as a taboo in Korean history. So basically, Crown Prince Sado was the son of King Yongjo, uh, the 21st monarch of Chosun, Korea. And throughout his life, his descent into madness became progressively worse. Uh, Sado displayed symptoms that we would probably call or relate to bipolar disorder today. Um, he eventually became somewhat of a serial killer um, and murdered various attendants in the palace. But the king and those around him really didn't understand anything about why Sado was acting so bizarrely. Um, so their response was that he needed to be executed, uh, not as a criminal, but they, instead they would seal him inside of a rice chest. Um, if he was executed as a criminal, it would bring shame onto the entire royal household and threaten the survival of the dynasty. Um, so basically, Sado was executed, and it was because of the taboo of his mental illness. But next slide, please. Okay. Uh, Net one more. But the people around Sado did try to help him, particularly his wife. And she did what many Koreans continue to do up until the early 20th century, and some still do today. And that is seeking divine intervention, uh, praying to the ancestors that the evil spirit which haunted him would be expelled. And, uh, his wife may expended many financial resources on these, you know, the conduct of these rites um, out of a desire to help him, but ultimately they were unsuccessful. So praying to the ancestors was only one way that people tried to address mental illness um, in traditional Korea. The other way was through Korean traditional medicine. Um, and that is because mental illness and physical illness were regarded as being closely linked 
uh, and mental illnesses were usually somatized. The other way that people sought relief was by um, engaging the services of Manchu, or as they're more pejoratively called, um, shamans. So this was a practice inherited from Imperial China, um, but families of the afflicted would ask um, Manchu to come perform chants and incantations, but also as part of these activities, the Manchu would beat the buttocks of the afflicted using a tao chi, a wooden wand normally made from uh, a peach tree. And up until the 1970s and the 1980s, there were articles you'll see in the Korea Times of prayer houses out on the outskirts of Gwangju and Seoul um, and people dying during these um, prayer sessions after being beaten repeatedly, sometimes for days on end, uh, by both Manchin and also by you know, Christian pastors and other pseudo-religious figures. And this is a, a quote from John Jacob Maria de Groot, who was a Dutch sinologist, and he wrote a book in 1910 called The Religious Systems of China. What he said is that whenever specters are believed to be working nearby, peach rods appear to be kept at home or frequently swung and brandished. So biomedicine was introduced to Korea by Christian missionaries, mostly from North America, around the mid 1880s. But it was only after 1910 and annexation by the Japanese um, that biomedicine gained in leverage and became a true alternative to Korean traditional medicine and some of the folk practices that I just spoke about. For the Japanese, biomedicine was used as an instrument of colonial expansionism. Um, back to this slide. You'll see in the picture here, this is the Relief Aid Center. For in Japanese, it was the Seisai Inn. And it was um, dedicated to caring for the blind, the deaf, and the mentally disabled. Uh, and it opened in 1911. But in 1913, responsibility for the mentally disabled was transferred from the Relief Aid Center to the Government General Hospital. Now, the Government General Hospital still stands today. It's on the campus of Seoul National University's medical campus. Um, it was built in 1907, and along with the Central Temple of Chungokyo, I'd say it's one of my favorite buildings from the Dehan Empire period. But it had the first actual psychiatry ward in Korea. And it started off with 35 inpatient beds. And that number would grow by 1924. And uh, from 1926, it became affiliated with Gyeongsang University, the Kaigo Imperial University. The hospital was staffed primarily by Japanese psychiatrists. Um, and there were a few Koreans who studied there after it merged with the university. However, we consider them mostly to be tokens. Uh, the majority of students continued to be Japanese, as well as the patients. Uh, up until 1930, there was just over 1,000 patients treated for mental illness at the Government General Hospital. 576 of them were Japanese, uh, while just over 500 were Korean. So this tells us that on a per capita basis, the Japanese were treated in far greater numbers. Um, some of the reasons for that, well, the cost of treatment was unaffordable um, and Koreans were still content to keep them what they confined at home. Um, the other thing I would say here is most of the patients who were treated in this hospital, if they were not seeking treatment on their own volition, uh, it was because they were brought in by the police for things like arson, petty theft, uh, sexual deviance, um, and fighting. And here you have a postcard from the colonial period, and you'll see the government general hospital. And it 
it looks fairly similar to what it's like today. So if you visit there, it's mostly administrative offices, but there is a medical history museum. Um, the government general hospital was not the only place that um, treatment of mental illness and um, mental disabilities occurred. Um, at Jadong, Jadong Wong, which later became Severance Union Medical College, um, you would have the treatment of mental illness by a fellow named Charles Inglis McLaren, who was a Scottish Australian Presbyterian. And he uh, came to Korea in 1911, shortly after marrying. He initially was stationed down in Jinju at uh, in Gyeongsam Namdo at the Mrs. Patton Memorial Hospital. But in 1913, McLaren uh, got a secondment to Severance Union and he was given a mandate to teach pediatrics and psychiatry for three months of the year. By 1930, and here you'll see Jadon Wan as it was. So this is McLaren. In 1930, he opened a very small six bed psychiatry clinic at the hospital. Um, and he was a practitioner humanistic psychiatry. He was very, um, he believed that patients could be cured and rehabilitated and that it ought to be treated with dignity and respect. And this would lead them to recovery. And uh, some of his, the students who he trained would later say that he'd spend two to three hours at a time in session with a, a single patient who's known to have a very good bedside manner. Uh, in 1938, however, McLaren was forced to return to Jinju. Um, he got into a dispute with the government over Shinto shrine worship. Um, and in 1942, he was deported to Australia shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He had one key protege, Yi Dong Tung. However, this fellow died in an unfortunate accident. So McLaren's approach to humanistic psychiatry really didn't survive through World War II. Here you have a photo of McLaren. Uh, it says he's lecturing, but presumably this is a patient before him, a nurse, and probably one of his residents. So during the colonial period, we know that mental illness was treated in some forms, but Korea was unique amongst Japan's colonies, uh, for it was the only one where there was no formal legislation relating to either um, the construction of asylums or institutions, um, or the confinement of patients with mental illness. Um, the Mental Patients Custody Act, which was passed in Japan in 1900, would later be applied to Taiwan and the Sakhalin Islands and Russia. Um, and its objective was upholding social order and protecting society at large. And that rhetoric is something that we'll see continue uh, as Korea drafted its own mental health legislation in the 1990s. The, the Mental Hospitals Act aimed to have asylums, whether they be public or private, uh, established in each of Japan's prefectures. Nothing like this was ever extended to Korea. Um, and it's presumably because the governor general of Korea had more powers than those in Taiwan and the Sakhalin Islands. They could push back against the diet and they were subservient to the emperor. Uh, but it also because in rural Korea, um, they didn't have the same amount of resources or police deployed on a per capita basis as Taiwan's countryside. Um, so presumably it would have been much harder to enforce these laws. Um, and there was also the issue of budget. So no budget to actually construct facilities. So really no reason to pass that type of legislation. <clears throat> Instead, in Korea, the authorities relied on two existing policies. Um, to enforce the isolation of people with mental disabilities. The first was 
the Minor Offenses Act. Um, it was applied in Korea four years after the Diet had passed it in Tokyo. Um, but what this legislation allowed was um, arrests without needing to take the offender to trial. So those who failed to confine mental patients in their homes could be charged by the authorities. And then you have the house to house investigation rule, which was used mostly by the colonial authorities um, to observe the living habits and, and learn about their colonial subjects. Um, but the colonial authorities kept lists of mental people with mental illnesses at the police boxes, and they could go house to house to check that those people were being confined and that the guardians of those people had the necessary permits. In Korea as well, you did have these which were relief stations for the homeless sick. I haven't been able to find photos of them in Korea, but these are what they looked like in Yamanashi Prefecture of Japan and Nagasaki. Um, but basically, they were established to provide treatment to homeless individuals, but under the legislation which created them, the mentally ill were considered the same as homeless sick. So some were treated in these facilities. Um, the Korean War marked really a new beginning for mental illness and psychiatry in Korea. Um, when the occupation by Japan ended, uh, there was only about 12 or 13 psychiatrists left in the country. Most had repatriated back to, to Japan. Um, the estimates some say could be as low as nine. So accounts differ depending on where you're reading it. Um, and initially during the war, the Korean army was treating psychiatric battle casualties with no knowledge of military mental health first aid. But in 1951, a uh, he was the director of the ROK Army's psychiatric program, and his colleague, also Kwan, they made contact with an American colonel named Albert J. Glass, um, who was with the 212 Neuropsychiatric Detachment of the 8th Army. And uh, you managed to convince Glass that they needed some training. So for six months, the two of them got to observe firsthand uh, their American counterparts at work uh, at the 8th Army Hospital. And over time, you also convinced them that the Korean military had no interest in improving its uh, psychiatric programs, uh, nor did the Korean government. So it ended up earning them the opportunity to go for a further six months along with two other colleagues to train at military hospitals in the United States. Fitzsimmons was one of them, and I think you was sent there. But when you returned then to Korea, he played a pivotal role in establishing a psychiatric program at the Capitol Army Hospital. And by the end of the war, there were 45 new psychiatrists trained, um, both in American dynamic psychiatry, as well as the basic principles of military psychiatry. After the war, <clears throat> training opportunities and support for Korea uh, continued under projects like the Minnesota Project, or as it's also known, uh, the Seoul National University Cooperative Project. Uh, this ran from 1954 to 1961 under the auspices of um, the precursor to USAID. And um, it not only provided support for rebuilding infrastructure, but it also allowed 77 faculty members at Seoul National University Medical College, where the old government general hospital was, 
to go to the University of Minnesota for training. And amongst these faculty members were those specializing in psychiatry. But during the war, only one psychiatric institution remained functional, albeit barely. And this is the Chongyang Brain Hospital. Um, you'll see in this picture what it looked like, not sure when this was, but it was reconstruct reconstructed in 1966. The hospital is now abandoned. Um, and this is what it looks like a few weeks ago. I'm near where I live in Chongyang. <clears throat> but basically the state of the Korean medical system was completely ravaged by the war. Uh, in 1952, there were only about 5,000 hospital beds available to civilians in the entire country. There was a shortage of physicians, nurses, technicians, and drugs. Um, and really the system just needed a complete overhaul. In 1956, when there was only 359 psychiatric beds in all of Korea, um, mostly in Seoul, there was 10 in the whole Nam region and about 30 in Gyeongsang, um, discussions got underway for the construction of a national mental hospital. Um, before its construction, um, the main facility for treating mental illness uh, was the National Veterans Mental Hospital in the Noryangji neighborhood. But, and, it, it, and also this Veterans Hospital provided minimal outpatient services. Um, and most of those hospitalized there were there for multiple days, weeks, or even months. Um, the other thing I'd say at the time, the budget was extremely limited. Uh, healthcare spending um, didn't exceed 1% of the national budget. And of that 1%, three fifths went to programs for people with Hansen's disease, or what you probably know as leprosy, um, or veterans. So it took almost five years for the National Mental Hospital to open. That was in 1960, uh, 1961. Uh, and it was initially supposed to have 500 beds when it opened, but because funding was so limited, uh, it only was able to open 360 beds. And until the 70s, uh, it really did continue to struggle with providing inpatient services at a rate that met demand. Um, and at a certain point, they were limiting hospitalization there to no more than three months and then discharging the person. Um, and that just led to people being readmitted because they weren't properly treated. Um, so whole issues with capacity that will see continue to reoccur over the decades to come. Um, this is a quote in the Korea Times from 1966, um, and it's by a Ministry of Health official who said, basically, our hands are full with managing communicable diseases. At the time, Korea really couldn't address mental health. The priority of the government was on tuberculosis, which in 1967 was affecting 5% of the population. And here you have another quote, and this is mental illness concerns the person afflicted. It does not kill others. So again, some of the rationale that we're seeing as to why it was not prioritized, tuberculosis could easily spread. So the government's efforts were there. Same with Hansen's disease, which was believed to be easily spread at the time. So, in 1961, Korea was an extremely poor country. Um, GDP was only $82 per capita. Uh, the public health system remained in disarray. As I said, 
capacity constraints, inaccessibility in rural areas, and high user costs. Um, for the Pak Chunki administration, um, population growth and controlling density was a main concern. Uh, economic growth was dependent on a population of mentally healthy and able-bodied individuals. So for the Park regime, the emphasis was on quality of the population rather than quantity. This drew on the rhetoric of both um, the Korean elites and Japanese public health officials who advocated involuntary sterilization as a solution to the mentally ill's criminal behavior in degeneracy. Now, illegal sterilization was something that um, was facilitated by public health centers, uh, local governments, and the Korea Family Planning Association during the Park regime. And a quote, and this is from an article in the LA Times in the 90s when the revelations about involuntary sterilizations came up and it was, it was taken for granted that people with mental illness would be sterilized. Public servants were asked to meet quotas and recommend sterilization prospects as part of the family planning drive. There was no sense of guilt or impropriety, so nobody paid much attention to it. At the same time, um, as well on the front of criminalization, um, most of the population was very scared of mental illness. In a 1973 survey, um, over half of the respondents among Seoul residents said that they were afraid of mental illness and that they would feel shame if a family member was to be diagnosed with a mental illness. Um, another interesting study from this time uh, found that when asked uh, whether they recognized mental illness and were shown a uh, paranoid schizophrenic, 86% of those uh, responded, yes, this is mental illness. But only 34% recognized mental illness when shown a withdrawn schizophrenic. Um, so th this kind of shows that schizophrenia and related, related disorders were perceived as dangerous, a risk, uh, and something that could precipitate violence and criminal behavior. Under Park Chung-hee, uh, expenditure on social welfare rarely exceeded 2% of the country's GDP. In, between 1962 and 1972, it dropped from 1.3% to 0.75%. And even if, as this was the case, um, Park chung hees government made it much more difficult for voluntary um, non-state agencies to provide their services to those in need. After the war, there was a tradition established by most of American Christian groups of providing um, welfare services including mental health supports. Um, however, his government brought in legislation that required these aid agencies to re-register every year and fulfill cumbersome reporting obligations. By the early 70s, most of the voluntary agencies in this sector withdrew from Korea and they were gradually replaced by government-friendly, state-sanctioned, social welfare organizations. And these government-friendly replacements were basically proxies and cooperative subjects of the public sector. Uh, and they were allowed to carry out their activities with minimal government oversight or supervision, though the government did provide them some subsidies for their operating costs. And as I'll talk about, the privatization of social welfare facilities combined with the state's exercise of biopolitics opened the door to very serious and egregious 
human rights violations against vulnerable groups. These are a few photos I actually found in a book I picked up last week. And they show kind of the situation on the streets of Busan um, in the 70s. A lot of poverty, a lot of homelessness, people who the government um, thought and went against its ability to take care of the general population and were in effect entitled to slaughter or the Pak Chung government, removal of parasitic bodies from visibility was something that could be done by labeling them as vagrants. And the structural conditions underpinning the social welfare system um, gave rise to their abuse, neglect, and exploitation. In many cases, disallowing life to the point of death. And for the, the state, it really saw the urban poor uh, as a threat to its preservation of the social order, um, its ability to conduct disease control, build hygiene infrastructure, and aestheticize urban space. So on December 15, 1975, the Home for Interior Ministry um, enacted this extra constitutional edict of Ordinance 410. And its objective was basically the purification of society through the extrajudicial isolation of, of so called vagrants for their own protection. <clears throat> when Chun Do Wan came to power uh, in the 80s, the National Assembly was suspended and his Junta's Legislative Council enacted a Social Protection Act, which again emphasized the need to protect the majority in society uh, at the expense of those blamed for social ills. So the Social Protection Act was applied uh, to many repeat offenders, but it also was extended to people with mental and physical disabilities and called for their institutionalization in welfare facilities. The Social Protection Act was found to be unconstitutional, quite obviously, in 1988, uh, but it wasn't fully scrapped until 2005. In the following year, presumably because the government saw the situation on the streets as so bad, Chen sent an order to his prime minister, Nam De Wu, a military man, um, saying, as begging by the disabled increases, please take note of the situation, crack down, adopt countermeasures, report back on the actions and the results. So one of the reasons why I think these anti-vagrant measures were stepped up was the interest of the government in hosting both the 1986 Asian Games and the 1988 Summer Olympics. A few months before his assassination, Park Chung-hee floated the idea of Seoul hosting uh, the Summer Olympics, believing that it could distract from the ruthlessness and the draconian excesses of the Yushin dictatorship and when Chun Do Wan came to power, he picked back up the proposal from Park, believing that hosting the games uh, could, on one hand, inspire national pride, and on the other, um, help change narratives about the illegitimacy of his regime, both at home and abroad. On top of that, um, Seoul was competing against Nagoya for the Summer Olympics. Um, so it would have been quite a big thing for Korea uh, to beat out its former colonizer to host the games, and obviously enhancing its international prestige. Here's a photo from the, the 1988 Olympics. This is how, just briefly, the vagrant accommodation system was to work in practice. 
Um, uh, it was supposed to be that people who were picked up um, would be transferred to specialized facilities to receive the help they needed. Uh, but this wasn't really followed in practice due to loose oversight, plaques monitoring, and corruption. I want to now talk about the Brothers Welfare Center, uh, or in Korean as it's known, Hyongjae uh, which is really, really was a human rights dead zone. Hyongjae Bokjiwon was Korea's largest run, uh, largest privately run social welfare facility uh, until it closed in 1987. Um, this, uh, maybe two months ago, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Korea concluded, concluded its investigation into the Brothers Welfare Center. Uh, originally, the number was estimated 513 deaths there over a 12-year period. Um, the revised figure was 657 deaths. Um, in Hongji Bokjiwan, forced labor, physical, mental, and sexual torture. Um, and it is really the representative case um, of abuses carried out in private social welfare facilities, uh, but on a grander scale. Um, at Hyongjae Bokjiwon, when I interviewed some survivors of it, um, I heard about the inmates being organized into platoons, um, which followed a strict military schedule, um, and the facility as a whole deprived the individual of any value, identity, or individuality. In the photo here, you'll see some vans that were from the facility and what would happen would be vagrants, whether they be mentally ill, homeless, children on the streets without a guardian, or people just stopped without proper identification, would be taken to the police boxes in Busan. And then the facility would come pick them up. Because so many, there was so much embezzlement and laundering, misappropriation of uh, subsidies, the facility would give police officers kickbacks for every person that they brought in. And the more subsidies are related to the number of people interned in a facility. So the more inmates, the more subsidies, the more opportunity to make profit. This photo here, you have some guards or staff from Hongjae Bukjiwa. And they're posing and they're identified by the yellow armbands. And here you have somebody being bundled into one of the vans by the facility staff. So the Brothers Welfare Center opened in the late 60s, but it was rephrased as a social protection facility in 1975. Um, it, per 1986 figures, there was close to 400 mental patients at the facility, and they were host, hosted in these three buildings, which were the psychiatric <coughs> ward, or as it was also known, the probation ward. Here you have a photo of some of the patients at Hongjae Bokjiwon in some sort of activity, uh, sitting before a nurse. And here you have them in their bunks. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, when it re re released its report, one of the new findings, something I hadn't come across in reading the results of the investigation carried out by Busan City or the initial investigation back in 1987 by opposition lawmakers, um, was evidence of chemical restraint through the overprescription of psychiatric drugs. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission managed to obtain the purchase list of the facility. There are a number of drugs you see here, um, which were purchased in huge quantities um, and administered to patients uh, 
to control their behavior, especially in disruptive ones. So Kyungje Bukjiwon was overseen and controlled by a man named Park Ing Gun. He was a boxer and a former soldier. He had a very sketchy service record and he said to have misrepresented himself on numerous occasions as a military police officer. He was also the president of the Korean Vagrants Association. And uh, he, he basically created a hell within a hell. Uh, for him, the inmates were dispensable. Their lives had no value. Uh, and according to testimony by some victims, um, his office had you know, 10 wooden baseball bats, uh, 30 pairs of bloodstained handcuffs. Um, and these witnesses uh, vouched that 40 to 50 inmates had died at his own hands. And according to a report by the opposition lawmakers, when they first um, uncovered the abuses in this facility, um, it was said that Park sold the corpses of the victims to various medical schools in the region at price tags of three to five million won each. This is a screen grab from a propaganda video in 1981, where Park um, presents himself as a godly and pious figure, um, using the forced labor of inmates at Kyungjaebokjiwon, a huge Presbyterian church was built on, on the site, along with a, a ranch for his personal use and a driving school. Here, uh, what I also will say is that he enjoyed quite close relationships with Chun Du Wan, the mayor of Busan and other government officials. He passed away in 2016, and he managed to get off with only uh, a two and a half year prison sentence, um, mostly for financial crimes. Uh, he retained much of the wealth that he got out of Hong Jae Bok Juan, and uh, some of it was used to actually purchase a golf course in Australia. Um, but basically, the case was swept under the rug because the judiciary was not independent. It was subservient to political interests and the regime. And also with um, the democratization movement picking up steam around this time, 1987, uh, there were many issues that overshadowed Hyun Jae Bok Juwon. <clears throat> Here you have some forced labor at the facility. Um, there was a number of sweatshops making clothes, shoes, uh, metal welding, all sorts of things all happening within the premises of this facility. And like I said, Kyung Jae Bok Juwon is a representative case and probably the most well known. However, two weeks after uh, Kyung Jae Bok Juwon was unearthed and revealed in 1987, uh, law, lawmakers from the New Korea Democratic Party uh, initiated an investigation at Taejong Songjiwon, uh, a facility in Taejong City. And their suspicions were triggered by the deaths of 80 individuals there over just a two year period, as well as the escape of 20 individuals um, in February 1987. And these individuals, when they escaped from Taejong Songjiwon, uh, they pleaded with the police that they were being tortured uh, and were in desperate need of help. When the opposition lawmakers reached the gates of this facility, um, they encountered the proprietor and a friend of Park and No Che Jung, uh, who unleashed a, a, vile, a violent torrent of abuse at them, and he incited facility staff as well as some unruly patients to attack the lawmakers. Um, and the police who accompanied the lawmakers were almost helpless to do anything about it. So they never managed to make their way into the facility. 
And here you'll see a photo of the lawmakers occupying the governor's office uh, in Chungcheng province, demanding that an investigation be carried out by the government. Um, rather than listening to their concerns, the justice minister at the time uh, berated these lawmakers for trespassing on private property uh, and conducting an unlawful inquiry without the National Assembly's consent. The head of Taejong Songjiwon, No Jae Jung, would go on operating this facility as well as others in the Taejong region for more than a decade, using them like Park England to embezzle copious sums of money. Two years later, this was another facility run by Chong Song Wong, Mo Jung's foundation. Um, and in that facility, uh, there was 312 children with mental disabilities. Um, the facility was staffed by a single doctor. Um, the footage that I found I believe it was from NBC News at the time. It was completely heartbreaking, just filled, decay, terrible situation all around. And there, there, like I said, there's no shortage of cases. These aren't isolated incidents. Um, going back from 1966, you have an example of home confinement, 25 year old man chained in his room for 17 years, and notes of similar cases like it. As I mentioned earlier, um, violent beatings of mentally ill individuals <coughs> to eliminate the demons residing inside of them. Um, pseudo psychiatrists um, holding people confined in a cave down in Guangzhou using ropes and chains, quasi religious leaders. And an interesting case in 1976 of uh, pot smokers being sent to a mental hospital in Unkyong um, for medical observation, over a thousand of them. A few more cases here, similar um, abuse, you know, beating of patients with clubs, chaining them with ropes, um, unauthorized drug injections, forced <clears throat> abortions, you name them. And even despite the passage of the Mental Health Act in 1995, you have numerous incidents occurring of private welfare facilities engaging in corruption, mistreating inmates. Um, some of the representative examples are the Scots Owl Village, um, that is known as almost the Buddhist equivalent of Hyung Jae Bok Jiwon. It's run by a self proclaimed monk who ended up fleeing to China. You have Jae Han. Sushi Wan, which was on an island uh, called Yubodo. Um, and their patients were, you know, weren't even given shoes, clothing, uh, were forced to harvest fish and um, shellfish and farm salt. Uh, Yangji Village, this one was again, this was operated by No Che Jong from Taejong Songji Wan. So it was only in 1998. Uh, that he was sentenced to four years in prison for financial crimes. But even then, his Chung Song Wong Foundation remained firmly under <coughs> his family's control. And as of 2020, uh, Chung Song Wong had 12 facilities still in the Taejong area, registered in the names of Noh's first wife and his three sons. In Sejong, uh, there was a spin-off corporation and it ran four facilities and these were registered in the names of his second wife and his daughters. Meanwhile, if we talk about Park Ingun again from Hyung Jae Bok Ju Won, um, when he was released from prison in 1991, he returned as CEO of the Brothers Welfare uh, Support Foundation. That foundation was renamed um, using the money from the sale of the facility, um, they purchased another facility, um, and it was for uh, accommodating the disabled, and it remained operational until 2017. A few more cases, the Wongju House of Love, the Ingang Foundation, Dolan's House, and the Daegu Hope Center. The Daegu Hope Center is, I think, the last 
major uh, case of abuse of the mentally ill on a large scale. And that was and the result of that was an apology by its administrator, the Catholic Church Diocese of Bayview. So up until 1995, Korea had no mental health. But the first proposal for a mental health act was in 1968. Um, there was two separate calls. The first by the Korean Neuropsychiatric Association. Um, that association was calling for a mental health act uh, that would professionalize psychiatric practice, ensure patients' rights, and expand service delivery. Meanwhile, you have the Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, call for a mental health mental health legislation for the purpose of protecting society. No actual legislation was formally tabled at that time. The next significant call for legislation came in the mid 80s after a KBS documentary an investigative show called Tracking 60 Minutes exposed on uh, conditions in some unauthorized facilities. On their program, they showed patients chained in filthy cells and shackled with bike irons. So legislation was then actually put forward, uh, but it died on the order paper. And that was because of opposition from um, opposition lawmakers, as well as the National Council of Korean Churches. Now, the reason for that is because there were certain clauses in the legislation about involuntary hospitalization. And at that time, there were concerns um, related to the Soviet practice of using psychiatry as a state instrument for the control uh, and oppression of political dissidents. In 1991, we had the Justice Minister call for legislation, not for improving the welfare of patients, but for crime prevention. This came after two incidents in 1991, one of a mentally ill individual from Davie uh, committing an arson at a nightclub that killed 16 people, and another of a car ramming on Yoido Yo uh, that caused 23 casualties. Over the next few years, debate continued, precipitated by events like a fire in a non-san psychiatric hospital that killed uh, 34 patients who had been shackled to their beds. And finally, in 1995, we had a co-op passed. Uh, and that was in consultation and very much inspired by Japan, that, which had also passed similar legislation in the years prior. The 1995 law um, clarified the duties of, relative act, um, of the relevant actors. It defined the different categories of facilities, and it recognized in principle the ideal of community-based mental health services. But it was a far cry from a patient's bill of rights. Um, it was most substantively concerned with regulating the mental health care system specifically um, hospitalization procedures. So what was required for admission and for discharge. Since 1997, when the first Mental Health Act was revived, the main concern with it remains involuntary hospitalizations. Some of the key concerns that were highlighted by the National Human Rights Commission of Korea are admission at the request of somebody other than the patient's guardian, the extension of hospitalization without the guardian's consent, the forgery of medical records for prolonging hospitalization, hospitalization without the sign off of the psychiatrist, unjustified refusals of patients' discharge requests, and also admission by a guardian, but without considering the best interest of the patient. This law has actually been in the news in Korea um, because a very prominent politician uh, has had allegations made against him 
that he misused his powers under Article 25 of the Act, which empower mayors and provincial governors, as well as district commissioners, to order the immediate confinement of persons suspected of having uh, a mental illness that puts either themselves or the greater public at risk. So E. J. Myung, the head of the Minju Bank of the Democratic Party of Korea, uh, was alleged to have had his brother uh, institutionalized, um, abusing his powers as mayor of Songnam City for this purpose. And the controversy here um, followed him as he contested for governor of Gyeonggi Province, and it continued to dog him in the 2022 presidential campaign, although he was cleared of the charges against him by court in 2020. Um, and there's a book, it was quite popular in Korea, and it's called Goodbye E. J. Myung, and that deals with some of the allegations. So where do we stand today? Um, today, one other point about the involuntary hospitalization. Um, in 2008, there was quite a prominent case where a Korean woman named Omi Suk, uh, who had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and chronic paranoid um, delusions, sought refugee status in Canada. Canada's Immigration and Refugee Board actually uh, granted her convention refugee status, um, concluding that on a balance of probabilities, Korea's efforts to protect the rights of the mentally ill uh, have fallen short of providing oh, adequate treatment. Um, some, uh, and just to continue on this, a few improvements have been made to the law. Um, host involuntary hospitalization have, now has to be reviewed every three months rather than six months. And uh, guardians also have to obtain the sign off of not one, but two psychiatrists, uh, I believe preferably from separate institutions if they are going to institutionalize somebody uh, against their will. Uh, but challenges remain, and that is persisting restrictions on freedom of correspondence, limitations on patients' privacy. So many are under 24 hour surveillance with CCTV cameras, uh, both in the toilets and showers, uh, forced labor in the name of occupational therapy, emotional abuse, physical violence and intimidation, chemical restraint and unsafe and unsanitary living conditions. And all of these are from uh, complaints that have been filed with the National Human Rights Commission of Korea. Um, and their conclusions, which are all posted online. So in a nutshell, some of the key issues that we've talked about today are the criminalization and stigmatization of individuals with mental disabilities, um, the deprioritization of the mental health care system is not a political priority. It lacks in, uh, sufficient inpatient capacity and there are minimal community care options um, the lack of sufficient capacity has led to human rights abuses um, stemming from the outsourcing of the state's welfare responsibilities, but also from a desire um, to isolate social ills and purify society. Um, Deinstitutionalization in Korea um, is a very complex process, and it is not one that can happen overnight. Um, service planning has to occur in consultation with patients and their families. Um, you cannot in, uh, be institutionalized um, and put patients out with no care options in the community, and you can't put, place the burden of care on their family members. Um, that would, I think, result in significant disadvantages to the patient. Um, there, I believe still ought to be an ombudsman office in Korea specifically tasked with managing um, human rights complaints from patients and monitoring these facilities. The monitoring of all facilities nationwide is something that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 
called for and its uh, report on film de Bourdieu, um, and a few other suggestions of public education about disability rights. Mental illness is still a taboo in Korea. There needs to be capacity building programs for lawmakers who are addressing disability rights issues. And this is also in consideration of the backlash against the deinstitutionalization plan that was released last year. That was criticized as not provisioning enough funding um, and having the bar set too long for progress. And there has to be investments made in community care services while at the same time improving existing facilities and ensuring that they are compliant and providing uh, safe and stable living arrangements for the people institutionalized in them. So I think I've just gone over an hour, but I thank you very much for listening and with my contact details out there. If you have any for the future um, questions. Jack, thanks very much. That was, uh, wow, comprehensive and interesting. I'm going to let you field your own questions. Okay. I don't need to, yeah, you know, do that. I'll ask John and Brian, you know, if there's somebody on the online, you know, rotate that through with uh, Jack, if you would, please. <laughs> so, Oh, um, how does insurance company or insurance industry play a role in this? It's an interesting question. I didn't study the insurance industry in great depth, but don't quote me on it. There were, uh, there was a case, I believe, where under, might have been the Mental Health Act, where insurance companies could reject um, people requesting plans if they had any type of mental illness. Um, I believe a ruling or comments on that were made by the, um, by the National Human Rights Commission. It actually also came up um, in front of the United Nations um, Commission on the Rights of People with Disabilities it raised concerns that Korea had placed a reservation, I believe, in its accession to the convention saying uh, relating to extending insurance. Um, so the UN commission, I believe, had called out Korea for, for this clause and asked them to amend them. Whether they have been or not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it has to, there's different pieces of legislation relating to that. Uh, as well as some, I think, specific legislation relating to insurance. We've got two questions on the computer. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure out if Tom wants to unmute, but uh, okay. Gloriana asked, are there any books in English you would recommend on the subject? There's only one book in English, okay. uh, unfortunately. And the RS library has a copy of it. It's called uh, It's Madness, the History of Mental Health in Colonial Korea. Uh, that book was written by Theodore Genu, whose quote I, I flashed on screen at the beginning. He's a professor at Yonsei of uh, Korean literature and modern language. Um, it, the book is great. It gives a very comprehensive overview of uh, you know, public reactions to mental health during the colonial period. It analyzes a number of uh, the main newspapers at the time. Uh, it talks about some of the cases relating to shamanism that I spoke about. So I, I definitely recommend that book. Unfortunately, nothing else in English, uh, yeah. except what I've written so far. Let's see if I can make Tom wonder. Tom, can you speak? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, this is an interesting historical perspective, but more germane to us today is what is the current situation of people who have uh, genuine mental conditions that are problematic, which may or may not be of a, a concern for the general welfare of society?
as well as themselves. In other words, there, there was a situation once upon a time where uh, people with mental health conditions uh, were without real political rights where they could be potentially involuntarily institutionalized. Then some years ago, not so long ago, uh, there was a kind of a rebalancing or maybe overbalancing, depending on your perspective, where uh, you cannot simply put someone into an institution without their permission. So this brings up a whole slew of issues because there's an absolute need for people to have their human rights preserved, but that's on the presumption that the person has the mental capacity to adjudicate his or her own welfare vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the concerns of society. So that you can have, and we do have individuals who really need to get professional help, but uh, steadfastly refuse that assistance. Uh, you can call it institutionalized, you can say, is putting them into involuntary uh, incarceration, but they are potential dangers to society as well as to themselves. On the other hand, as um, this lecture points out, uh, there's been too much, way over too much of people being abused uh, involuntarily. So what is the current situation and where are we going on the struggle of the individual's human rights versus uh, society's need uh, to protect the individual and the general welfare of the community? Thanks, Tom. Great question. Um, the position of the Korean government is still that there cannot be complete deinstitutionalization and that patients can be free to um, make decisions autonomously 100% of the time. So the Korean government's position uh, is counter to that of the UN Commission on the Rights of People with Disabilities. The UN has, in my opinion, adopted a fairly radical position that says there has to be 100% deinstitutionalization. There can be no um, alternative decision-making other than that coming directly from the patient, whether they're capable or not. So I think in Korea, the, the struggle right now it is balancing what the UN asks of it with its own concerns, as you point out, with people who are very much a danger to society, um, but cannot make the decision or may not want to make the decision to seek help. So right now, um, the position of the government here is gradual deinstitutionalization um, and maintaining the provisions within the Mental Health Act that guardians or public authorities can have um, people involuntarily committed. However, with more safeguards against some of the abuses that have existed in the past. So I think the main concern is right now is when will the funding come and how quickly it will be um, put towards programs that can both address needs in the community and improve needs within the existing institution. I hope that answered some of your question. Uh, if I could have one small follow-up on this. It sounds like there's two uh, categories of people. One group that's been kind of uh, grandfathered to the legacy of the past who are institutionalized. Yeah. And then you have another group of people who may have similar uh, mental challenges, but have not yet been institutionalized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that are coexisting. Right. So you have this dichotomy of, uh, of a double standard based on historical precedents. Yeah. And then the other interesting thing kind of on the deinstitutionalization question is that there you have some of the civil society organizations that have adopted a very extreme position calling for 100% deinstitutionalization. They actually have, these are some of the groups engaged in the subway protests right now. And some of their posters 
um, in Sangatji station, other way, they compare the situation to the T4 program of Nazi Germany, which I, I certainly don't agree with. You also have patients, families uh, in civil society organizations representing them that are not opposed 100% to deinstitutionalization, but are very worried that such an extreme position as advocated by others um, would put them in a very precarious situation and leave them without um, the proper resources to care for their family members and those who they're responsible for. So a lot of debate within um, the community and as well as amongst politicians. Well, we might have a question. We have another question, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I thought you were saying. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Okay. We see you. We don't hear you. No, we don't hear oh. you. No, we hear you. Okay. Hi. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So um, thank you for your um, talk. I learned a lot about um, mental health, health institutionalization. My question is uh, um, you. I wonder how you define men mental health education. I mean, men mental health uh, what was that, care facilities or inst institutions. Because uh, when you talked about, at first you covered the kind of professional mental health uh, facilities. And then once uh, you talked about Chengyangni Mental Health Hospital, then you moved on to like uh, Hyongjae Bokjiwon or, or other organizations. I mean, it's really interesting and great to learn about it, but you know, can you really define those institutions as uh, actually mental mental health facilities? And uh, uh, what really, you know, professional mental health care facilities that you don't really cover and what really happened to them and how they're like uh, uh, working affected the, the um, establishment of uh, uh, laws. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. So I moved to some of the private facilities in the 70s and 80s because they took up the majority of patients at the time based on the, the laws that were passed and the ordinances. The, the issue with professionalized facilities um, throughout those decades continued to be struggles with um, managing capacity and providing treatment uh, at a level that was affordable to the general public. Most of the pro professionalized facilities charged user costs that were only something people with support maybe from the government as veterans or from fairly well-to-do families could access. However, the main facility at the forefront of mental health care in Korea since its establishment, we talked about it a little bit, the National Mental Hospital has been the National Mental Hospital. And the mental, National Mental Hospital has very much followed international trends. Um, from the early 70s even, it was experimenting with things like uh, social psychiatry, um, psychodrama, uh, you know, experimentations with LSD. It, it's been trying to provide treatment in line with international standards. However, most other facilities, uh, unless they're within the National Mental Health Center's network and its regional networks are private facilities. Um, and a lot of those private facilities, while some do their, certainly um, serve patients with their best interests and try to support them in the best way possible, um, a lot of them have been caught up in just simple hospitalization, uh, treatment that is not terribly disproportionate between uh, patient symptoms and over reliance on you know, things like over prescription of drugs um, in inpatient hospitalization, so isolation from society. So the, the main issue is, like I said, incapacity within the professional system to treat those who need it on a grand scale, which has pushed more and more people into these private, unreg unregulated facilities. If I can make a, an interesting comparison yeah. 
In the US, the largest uh, mental health care providers are prisons. Mm -hmm. So that might kind of show how people who need mental health services end up in various types of facilities. Yeah. I don't know if we have time, but we have a question from Jacko. Yeah, sure. Hi, Jack. It's Jacko here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. good to hear from you. Okay, so um, my question is following on from your previous answer. You said that um, uh, modern Western mental health was only really carried out uh, in Korea by the very small uh, and understaffed facilities of the Korean National Mental Hospital. I'm wondering, during those decades when things pretty much went off the rails everywhere else in Korea, were there any voices like the Korean uh, National Mental Health Hospital uh, crying out in the wilderness and saying, hey guys, uh, that's not how you do it. Uh, there are modern techniques, we're learning, take a look at what we're doing, give us more money and we could do a better job than what you're doing by locking people up, something like that. It, did, did you see any sign that that was going on that there were counter narratives or, or, or people calling out warnings? Thank you. Uh, the, the one main call out that I saw was in 1968. It was by the Korean Association of Neuropsychiatrists and they had called for a mental health act to really professionalize practice and expand service delivery um, and help bolster patients' human rights. So there were some voices coming from professional associations of psychiatrists. Once Hyung Jae Bok Ji Won was revealed, um, the Korean Bar Association and some of the church organizations did raise their voices uh, regarding human rights, but it was mostly on human rights issues as opposed to um, professionalizing practice. Once we get into 21st century, then you have more CSO civil society organizations calling out for change around things like involuntary hospitalization and then some of the human rights questions that have been in complaints brought before the Human Rights Commission of Korea. Looks like Tom has one more question. We don't have much time, so yeah. hopefully it's an easy one. Uh, leading the effort in public education yeah, and mental health. Right now, I don't think there is a significant effort being made, uh, but I would say the main actors involved there are civil society, but also the National Mental Hospital is doing some good work there to bring up these issues and present them to the broader public. Right, but is there anything done in like in the public school system? Um, to talk about I, mean, I, I don't have an answer for you there, but um, this is just a personal observation. In the universities here, when I compare it to those in North America, I think the discussions around mental health are, they do not occur with as great frequency. Um, the availability of services seem to be much more limited. Um, no, maybe others would have comments for you, but I don't want to say too much without giving you an answer that I know the past. Well, how about the influence of Netflix and other media like the uh, strange attorney? Uh, what was her name? Yeah, Yun So Yun. Talk about uh, talking about altruism and other mental issues uh, being more publicly explored and given a lot of empathetic uh, treatment. Does that have any influence of any kind? I'd say it definitely is. There's a drama that came out maybe two years ago called, I think, It's Okay Not To Be Okay with an Actress. So in YouTube. Um, but it was a big hit on Netflix. I think it was by TVN in Korea. And it was actually based in a mental hospital. And uh, the protagonist, protagonist of it had uh, some mental health issues. Um, and there was discussion around involuntary hospitalization um, in that drama, it's a 16 episode or something. So you're, you're starting to see more and more dramas tackle this, these issues. And also they're 
was about recent drama, um, extraordinary Wu. Um, attorney. Yeah, attorney Wu <laughs> that dealt with autism. So you have more and more dramas these days um, talking about both mental illness, physical disabilities, um, mental impairments, <coughs> and so on and so forth. So it's definitely helping. I would say. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We appreciate you being here. Okay.